Jamie with Chegg Tutors. Today I want to talk to you about a particular theory in literary theory called reader response theory. This is a school of literary theory developed in the 1960s and 1970s, mostly in Germany, sometimes in France, and in the United States. Key players in this include Wolfgang Eiser, C.S. Lewis, Roland Barthes, Stanley Fish, and other people. As you can guess by the name, this theory focuses on the reader's experience and response, including their emotional response and not just with what's in the text. In fact, in a way, the text is in the background in this theory, where reading is an interaction between author and reader mediated by the text. The text is not set and unchangeable, but something that the author and the reader create together as the reader experiences the piece. There are a lot of key things going on, and there's a lot of different kinds of reader response theory, but I'm just going to go into some of the basics that are common to all of them. Like we said, there's no one meaning for the text. So unlike many of your high school English teachers, you're not going to be hunting for the deeper meaning, trying to figure out the symbols, or trying to figure out exactly what the author meant. So it's a lot more exciting than your high school English teacher always said, go deeper. There are a lot of types of reading, but two main ones. You might read by choice, and then you have an aesthetic stance towards the piece, and you probably want to enjoy it, or you, you always want to enjoy it, but you probably will. And then there's efferent reading, where you're reading because you have to. You were assigned it in a course, or your parents told you to, whatever it is. There are lots of different types of readers in this theory, too. The ideal reader, who has all of the background knowledge that the author did, who knows everything about the historical context, who can analyze literary devices, and can get everything the author is trying to do. This is why it's the ideal and not a real reader. The implied reader, which might apply to an author like Dickens, who is speaking directly to some sort of you, second person, um, in a work like David Copperfield. Um, there might be the critical reader. Uh, say we were reading um, a a racist text from, you know, a hundred years ago, you're going to be critical of the text and try and figure out the bias of the author. And you're not, you're going to kind of going to be in a hostile relationship with the author. You might have the resisting reader who we call the struggling or resisting reader in the classroom as well. There are other kinds of readers, but those are probably the most important ones. Now in this theory, meaning is not something that's locked in the text or locked in the author's intention. It's nothing other than a process and the reader's moment-to-moment -moment experience of the text, not just intellectually, but also emotionally. This means that a text might be different, probably will be different, every time you read or reread it, or when different people read it. But unlike some of the critics of reader response theory, I don't think this means a free-for-all anarchic system where the text doesn't matter at all. If someone's explaining their response to a text, you still want to bring in the text. You still want to say, well, I responded to this part of the text. You don't want to say, you're not going to say, oh, well, the flying spaghetti monster read this text, and I think this is actually about UFOs. No. This is about practical criticism and how people actually read and construct meaning from a work, but it's still about the text. I really want to get um, across how this school came about, and it's a response to something called new criticism among and formalism, especially Russian formalism. In new criticism, the text is the only basis for interpretation. We're not bringing in the author's biography, our own biases or experience, um, our historical knowledge. The text is all there is. There are fixed meanings, and our job is to decode the meanings of the text. New critics, who are mostly poets, say there's a heresy of the paraphrase, by which they mean a poet can't, a poem can't be paraphrased. A text can't be paraphrased because every word in it matters. Everything is a choice of the author that was intentional. There are symbols and devices and levels of meaning, and everything is purposeful. To them, a poet, a poem is not an object, is not an experience, it's an object. History doesn't matter, but these theories do agree in rejecting authorial intent 
you're just looking at the text in New Criticism. You're not trying to figure out what the author meant by it, really. They also reject the biography of the author. It's not important what in the author's life might have made him write this poem. You're just thinking about the text in New Criticism or your response to it in Reader Response Theory. Um, in terms of how this theory came about, an important precursor was I.A. I. Richards. He was the first one, really, to study how his Cambridge undergrads actually read poems, and he wrote a book about it called Practical Criticism. He is actually a new critic still, but he's studying how people actually read, and that's really what reader response theory is all about. He gave, What he did was he gave students poems without title or author. He had He recorded their responses to those poems, and to him he was recording what mistakes students made. Um, reader response theory wouldn't call it a mistake because he, there's, they're less focused on the fixed meaning of the text, but there are there are ways to misread things in reader response theory as well, um, or at least to miss things that are in the text. Um, you might have students who are so focused on formalism and all of the devices and the symbols that they kind of miss the basic features of the text. They can't tell you the who, what, where, when, and why, or the surface meaning and they can't do a paraphrase. Um, but there is um, ways that reader response theory rejects Richards' work. For example, to him, it's bad when a line reminds someone of something in their life. Um, he says, that's not part of our reading. That's not how we read poems. To a reader response theorist, that's a key part of how we read and how we construct meaning. So... I could try and give you an example reading, but actually I can't, because all I can do is give you my reading of one poem. Um, I can describe my experience, but you have a different experience, and we'll look at that in a sec with a specific poem. But in reader response theory, we think about the effect on the reader of certain authorial choices, and also the key effect of background knowledge and life experience. Someone who comes to a poem not knowing something about the history of the civil rights movement, might have a difficult time with a poem from the Harlem Renaissance. Someone who comes full of history might impute historical meaning to something that's maybe the author didn't intend. But it's okay that the author didn't intend that. They're still doing a valid reading of the text because they're still interacting with the author through the text. I want to give you an example. This is a poem by Theodor Ruthke called My Papa's Waltz. And this example really illustrates um, the importance of reader response theory for education today, because um, I'm going to talk a little bit about how my students responded to this poem when I taught it, and how I taught it as well. So pause this and take a second to read the poem. Notice your responses and what you think certain lines mean. For example, in stanza three especially, you want to think about how you are interpreting the father's intent towards the son. Okay, so let me tell you how this went down when I taught it. I never bring up my own interpretation of the poem before students have had a chance to read and process it for themselves. Um, but I've always thought that this poem is partly talking about um, child abuse, especially in line three, in stanza three. I believe that that's that the boy is happy, maybe that the father is there, but he's also dealing with a drunkard, alcoholic father who comes home late, does this little dance, but there's actually some violence to the dance that we see in stanza three. I would never bring this up to a student because that's just my personal interpretation of the poem, maybe influenced by my life history. But if a student does bring up that he thinks or she thinks that this poem is a little more sinister than we might read it at first, then absolutely I'm going to address head-on the issue of abuse or alcoholism um, because I, I need to validate that student's reading and also realize that that student may have a personal history that makes them read this a certain way. So it's really about allowing students to have their experience of the text first and not imposing your own views, but then discussing it together as an interpretive community, what we call an interpretive community, in this case the classroom, the particular class and the teacher, um, and we can construct meaning together and share our readings of the text, and in that itself we are extending the experience, our experience of the text, 
that is also a part of reader response, not just the individual reader's personal response to the poem, but how that response can be changed and interpretation can be changed by hearing others' experience of the poem. So that's a little on reader response theory. I encourage you to keep it in mind, especially if you're a teacher, as a way to teach poetry that still includes poetic devices and formalism and word choice and symbolism as tools students can use to read, but also really allows the students to experience the poem for, their, for themselves and construct meaning for themselves. This also increases self-confidence in analyzing poetry because so many students are intimidated by a poem on the page. They say, oh, I don't understand this, the language is weird, and I, I'm too stupid to know what the real meaning is. We want to get away from saying there's one deeper meaning and have a conversation with students about what we interpret in the poem together. Thanks for watching and see you next time.